Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Public Interest recogni Recognition Reception at Miami Law. I'm Marnie Lennon, and I have the privilege of being the Assistant Dean for Public Interest and Pro Bono and the Director of the HOPE Public Interest Resource Center. First, I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. These are extraordinary times, and the resilience of our community and the collaboration of our community um, just keep shining through as we convene via Zoom tonight and recognize Miami Law's ongoing and always needed commitment to public interest and public service. The opportunity to celebrate our pro bono ethic and our commitment to service and advocacy is critically important as we navigate the impact of COVID-19 and ongoing barriers to access to justice. Tonight we'll shine a light on some of the contributions knowing that our community is filled with students, faculty, staff, alumni, and community partners who give of themselves to promote equality, access to justice for all. It's with great pride and joy that I convene this welcoming um, comments and welcome you to our Zoom tonight. A few notes before we get started. Please take a moment to make sure that your mic is muted. We have a wonderful array of presentations and speakers and honors to, to bestow tonight, and this will ensure that our speakers who get on screen can be heard um, as they're presenting. And we're recording this session. We know that people near and far are navigating challenges, as I mentioned, and some are not able to join us this evening, but we will make this ceremony available later. So please share with classmates, colleagues, community partners, and friends. Without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Dean Tony Verona, who has the distinct honor of leading Miami Law through these unprecedented times, and who from the moment he started as Dean and the moment he visited our campus, demonstrated his deep commitment to the relationship between education and community, law student and lawyers to advocacy, and, and his own work on behalf of marginalized communities to promote fairness, his demonstrative of this quality that he has brought to Miami Law. We're so pleased to have him here tonight, and we thank him for welcoming you. Dean Verona. Marty, thank you very much. It's such an honor to be here. Uh, I can't wait to uh, be in everyone's physical presence so that I could not congratulate you in person. But for now, we are here on Zoom making the best of it. Let me start by thanking the Hope Public Interest Resource Center, Assistant Dean for Public Interest and Pro Bono, and uh, our Director of the Hope Public Interest Resource Center, the wonderful Marnie Lennon, uh, HOPE's Assistant Director, Sharon Booth, Assistant Director of Public Interest Advocacy and Programs, Sarah Bice. What, what a fantastic team they make with uh, HOPE's Office Manager, Dietra Fleming. Thank uh, you all for working very hard to put on this extraordinary event. I give thanks everyone uh, to everyone who is here via Zoom today for taking time to connect with us uh, on this very special occasion. It's really my pleasure and my big honor to uh, welcome you uh, and, and really to celebrate uh, pro bono and public interest at Miami Law, two extremely important values to us. As one of the top ranking law schools in the country for public interest, Miami Law is the place to be if you wanna make a difference. Here at Miami Law, we are deeply committed to providing students with opportunities to meaningfully contribute to others through public service and pro bono opportunities. Throughout tonight's program, you will hear many examples of how many members of the Miami Law family has ma have made lasting impacts on the lives of their clients and on their communities. Thanks to your dedication to public service and to a pro bono ethic, you have served some of the most vulnerable and marginalized members of our, uh, our entire so society in the most desperate times of their lives. Public service has always been very central to my being. Um, I, as many of you know, I served as the first uh, general counsel and legal director to the Human Rights Campaign after having served as, as its lead pro bono counsel when I was in private practice for several years. Um, I've served as a, as a Wasserstein Public Interest Fellow at Harvard Law School, and so you know this is this is something that's that I. Uh, love that that we that we do here and and one of the highlights of of my first year uh, here now really more than ever as we face a public health crisis that threatens our physical emotional and financial well-being lawyers play a vital role in providing access to legal services to those who need 
them most. Hope is also serving as a hub for ongoing public in interest and pro bono opportunities in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. And I encourage you and others to keep an eye out for future service opportunities by connecting with Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Hope E! News. I cannot be prouder of all that you have accomplished for your clients and for Miami Law, our law school, and I could not be any more grateful for your service to our Miami Law family. So everyone, congratulations. Thank you. Marnie, back to you. Thank you so much, Dean Verona. Very much appreciate your words and your legacy of service that you bring to Miami Law. It's now my honor, as you mentioned, Dean, the, the important role that lawyers play in addressing all of the injustice we face on an ongoing basis and in the wake of COVID-19 um, will really um, be effectuated by the lawyers who are willing to step up, the community members who are willing to engage, and our law students who are able to help. And it's for that reason we have invited Josh Spector to speak to our, our community tonight. Josh is an exemplary graduate who was recognized by the Florida Bar for his dedication to pro bono service. Since graduating in 2002, Josh has embodied the spirit of public service, and I would have to say he also did on campus as a student leader. He represented more than a dozen clients in the foster care system, including a case which spanned eight years and a case that went before the Florida Supreme Court. He was given the Children's Champion Award in 2019, and devoted over 265 hours to guardian ad litem cases in the last couple of years. His efforts have really enabled dozens of students, uh, dozens of students, dozens of children to acquire permanency, the goal for stability and family. He's the former president, uh, former president of our Law Alumni Association, former SBA leader, and a wonderful mentor to generations of students. He's the real deal. He's humble, he's dedicated, he is an incredible advocate, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce you to Josh to share a few words tonight. Thank you, Dean Lennon. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you. It's also my privilege. Every time I come back to the people of hope, I leave campus grateful, optimistic, energized, and inspired. Uh, I come and I leave with hope, and that's something we could all use a bit more of these days. Why am I speaking? Uh, that, that's not a rhetorical question. That's when I actually asked Dean Lennon. Uh, I come before you suffering from a bit of imposter syndrome. I'm an 18-year business litigator. I do intellectual property litigation. Uh, I've never been employed by a nonprofit. I've only clerked for uh, an agency in the public sector. Uh, but I've been asked to speak with you about my experience in the private sector, the corporate sector, and the role of a, quote, functioning self-interested ethos, end quote. I wrote that down from Dean Lennon. Uh, to that end, I could tell you about how doing pro bono work hones your skills. I can tell you about how it raises your profile in the community. And I can tell you how it simply makes you feel good and satisfied with your day-to-day your -day work. Uh, but you know all that already uh, from what you've already done through Hope. Dean Lennon might tell you that I walk the walk, uh, but I don't know what the walk is I, because I don't know the path. What I've tried to do throughout my career is to take steps. So I'm going to tell you about some of my steps and some of my missteps. And you can glean from that whatever perspective or insight uh, you can. It's 1996 in Providence. I've graduated college. I turned down a new national touring program doing sexual assault prevention education, letting down my mentor and my biggest proponent. I've been in the Providence-based program for four years. I'm tired of the program. I don't want to spend a year in a van with these bright-eyed, bushy-tailed new volunteers. It's 1997. I'm in Austin, Texas. I'm a failing musician. I'm sitting in a diner with the future Pulitzer Prize winning author who's agreed to talk with me about a career in journalism. He tells me how he struggled. He tells me it's okay to not follow a dream. It's okay to want to take your girlfriend out for a nice meal. Don't be ashamed to want a comfortable life. I make a point to pick up the check. I make $18,000 a year working at the University of Texas at Austin. I can't afford a car and I'm a vegetarian by necessity. It's 1999. I'm trying to hide from Professor Stotsky's glare and avoid being called on. I'm one of the last people admitted to the class of 2002 at Miami Law. Professor Stotsky says to us, everyone wants to do good and do well too. It'll be the only thing I remember from Elements. 
It's 2001. I clerk for the Miami-Dade County Public Defender. My first depositions are in defense of an accused child abuser. I've spent my entire scholarship on an engagement ring. My buddy Todd has a passion for the mission. He'll become a public defender after graduation. I won't. We can't finish our picadillo in the break room as we watch the Twin Towers burn on September 11th. It's 2002. I've passed the bar exam. I've taken the oath of attorney. I'm cognizant of an obligation to perform pro bono hours. A law firm writes a check on my behalf. It's 2004. I'm at my second law firm, an international big law firm. They asked me about my pro bono plan. I realized for the first time they were actually serious about the firm's commitment to pro bono. They tell me to pick a case. I choose one for Lawyers for America, Lawyers for Children America, so I can manage junior associates. Later, I'm encouraged to take an incarcerated plaintiff case if for no other reason than to get some trial experience. It's 2008. On a lark, I answer a section-wide email of the Florida Bar Appellate Section asking for pro bono counsel for an incarcerated plaintiff. It's just a brief, they say. There'll be no oral argument. Two previous volunteers I learned backed out as the client was convicted of sex abuse on a minor, his stepdaughter. I agree to take the case. With the help of Hope's Evie and White de Leon, we file our brief. The Florida Supreme Court decides it wants to hear oral argument. We fly to Tallahassee, argue, and our client prevails. I get scolded for letting a certified legal intern sit at counsel's table, but I can now tell clients that I have argued at the Florida Supreme Court. It's 2008. I'm a lawyer for presidential candidate Barack Obama. I don't do anything, but I keep the training packet to show my kids someday. It's 2009. I convinced Lawyers for Children America to file an amicus brief with the Florida Supreme Court in favor of same-sex parents' right to adopt children from foster care. We joined some other groups. My name is left off the brief. Not for nothing. I can tell my kids someday that I took a step for LGBTQ rights. It's 2010. In my case for UM Children Youth and Law Clinic, the judge is compelling my client, a pregnant minor, to testify as to paternity. I'm concerned I don't know how to stop the judge. I'm concerned my client is lying under oath. I struggle to remember the proper procedure from ethics. It's 2017. I've recently wrapped up an eight-year case for Lawyers for Children America. My handler retires to the islands. I can't do this anymore. I look for shorter pro bono engagements. It's 2019. I found shorter pro bono engagements. I'm now eight appeals in for the Florida Statewide Guardian and Litem program. I've never met any of these kids or their parents, but I've spent enough time in juvenile court to appreciate the role of the Guardian and Litem program, so I trust the process. I believe it is making a difference, but I'll never see it. I wonder if some kid will look me up someday and tell me that I helped. I fear that some kid will reach me and tell me that I hurt, but mostly I hope no one ever calls. It's 2020. I'm speaking to a room of talented, passionate people who want to make a difference, who may have already made a difference, who will make a difference. I'm cognizant that my overuse of the first person pronoun reveals self-absorption. I put that aside to focus on my audience. I tell them, the work you've done already has made an impact. Maybe your work has been the most important thing in someone's hardest moment. Whatever your impact so far, it's the path you're on that matters. We can't wait to see what you do, and we hope you make a splash. But if you don't, it's okay to wade in. You can do good and do well too, and you can walk your walk in any direction. You just keep taking steps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you for serving as a wonderful and humble example of what it means to be a lawyer in the truest of senses. Now from one thoughtful human to another, it's my pleasure to now introduce Drew Dawson, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and holder of the Judge A.J. Crystal Endowed Chair in Bankruptcy. At the investiture for the chair, Judge Crystal mentioned that his greatest joy was helping those most in need. And I sent a message immediately to Drew saying, that's why you're the recipient. Dean Dawson's selfless dedication to enhancing the law school experience for all has been a gift to our learning community. As someone who goes above and beyond to be thoughtful, to analyze, to think, to learn, to do with principle, we thought it appropriate that he introduced some of our students who have also gone above and beyond in their commitment to community and pro bono. Dean Dawson. Thanks, Dean Lennon. Thanks for having me here. It's so fun to be here and see all of you. I was going through the gallery view when I first signed on. It was really nice. Great to see uh, alumni on here. I saw Julie Kane on there and Jason Kerala. 
uh, all the students that we miss seeing on the bricks. Uh, of course, you, Dean Lennon, DL, affectionately known, and we can all aspire to have cool nicknames like that. Thank you for having me. And uh, Josh, thank you for sharing those wonderful words. And I, I think we all feel that way, waiting to see the amazing things these students do. But I have the honor of being able to talk about some of the amazing things they've done already in law school. Our students really engage in such an amazing array of community service, service in our community, our local community here, and really just around the world. And so we get to celebrate the students who've like chosen to dedicate so much of their time to pro bono work, to community service. And I get the privilege of being able to recognize a few of the stars who've gone above and beyond. So Dean Lennon, maybe we'll start with the community service challenge. Right, and the community service challenge, we ask every student right, to complete, we challenge you to complete a minimum of 25 hours of community service each year. This year, three students are being celebrated for earning the most hours in their class. The outstanding 1L is Jenna Burado, who has a passion for supporting children and families. Kudos, Jenna. The outstanding 2L is Emily Sanchez, who's dedicated to access to health services. Round of applause for Emily. And the outstanding 3L is Teresa Pinto, who is dedicated to preserving and protecting the environment. Congratulations, Teresa. Congratulations to all, all three of you, uh, Jenna, Emily, and Teresa, for your outstanding commitment to doing community service. Um, We'd like to celebrate all the students who met the Community Service Challenge who logged their hours this year, as you can see on this slide. Congratulations, this is really an amazing accomplishment. Way to go. You rose to the challenge. Okay, so that was the Community Service Challenge. Now for the Pro Bono Challenge. This challenges our students to complete 75 hours of pro bono work prior to graduation. Right? No credit, no compensation for this work. The work is performed for a nonprofit or a government agency and the supervision of attorney. We would like to recognize and congratulate those students who have gone above and beyond and have completed the greatest number of pro bono hours among their peers this year. All right, drum roll. I hear the collective drum roll, even though you're all on mute. Outstanding 1L, Abril Montero Doxer, who worked with Caba's Pro Bono Project. The outstanding 2L is Langdon Lyle, who worked in the third DCA. And outstanding 3L is Tesneem Shreta, who worked in the Palm Beach County Office of the Public Defender. We can all do our round of applause. Wonderful, thank you so much. We congratulate all the students who met the pro bono challenge. Students will be recognized for this accomplishment with a notation on their transcripts. And it's a really nice long list, a long list of students here that we can all be proud of. So we can scroll through here, you see many of your classmates and it's really just marvelous they were able to donate that much of their time. Again, no credit. No pay for this work. Thank you all. Uh, Dean Lennon, with that, I get to pass the mic back to you. Thank you so much, Dean Dawson. Uh, we really celebrate all of those amazing students and those of you who did not log your hours and we know that you continue to do good work in the community and as advocates. Um, it's now my opportunity to celebrate our graduating students from the Miami Scholars Program. The Scholars Program is a cohort for students for three years at Miami Law. Those students have a demonstrated commitment to public service prior to law school and outstanding academic records. We salute this year's Miami Scholars and thank them for their many contributions to our campus and to the community, inside the classroom, outside the classroom, and on behalf of public interest agencies, near and far. Congratulations to the class of 2020 Miami Scholars. Along the way, our students fortunately have the opportunity to engage in many programs and HOPE works diligently and thanks to the institutional support of Miami Law and our many donors to give students the opportunity to pursue their passion in summer jobs. 
This year, thanks to the generous contributions from our alumni, the proceeds from our HOPE auction, and Miami Law's institutional commitment, we are able to say to students, find your dream job in public interest, and we will support you and make it happen. As many of you know, there are two programs. One program is the HOPE Fellows Program, which gives rising 2Ls and 3Ls a chance to identify their dream agency and work along incredible advocates to effectuate justice. This year's HOPE Fellows could be seen on the slide coming up, and you'll note that the work that they're doing spans geography, spans the type of law, the work that they're doing, um, including areas such as environmental advocacy, immigration, civil rights, criminal justice, and more. We celebrate this year's HOPE Fellows and look forward to your leadership as fellows back on campus next year. Our fellows program asks of our students to bring those lessons learned back to the campus, to educate peers and to initiate projects to ensure that the advocacy opportunities our students have had as fellows will continue into the school year. Congratulations to all of our HOPE Fellows. Our next program is the SPIF Fellows, our second summer program, and it gives rising 2Ls the opportunity to be placed in local public interest agencies and engage in a social justice summer course. This year's students will be working in eight agencies across Miami-Dade and Broward, providing essential support to the attorneys there and the clients they serve. Congratulations to all of our fellows, and thank you again to our donors and the agencies and their supervising attorneys who mentor our students year in and year out. We could not support these students without you. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Keely Stewart. Dean Stewart is the Associate Dean for Experiential Le Learning and the Supervising Attorney in the Children and Youth Law Clinic. An advocate, a mentor, a supervisor, and a leader, Dean Stewart is an incredible force on our campus and a wonderful asset as she oversees our experiential um, education opportunities and our clinics. We want to thank you for your leadership and invite you to introduce this year's graduating students from our clinics and our programs. Thanks, Dean Lennon. Um, my job, as Dean Lennon said, is to give a shout out to all of the students in our clinics who've dedicated hours and hours of your law school career to helping some of the most vulnerable members of our community. Clinics play such an important role in contributing to social justice. While we may not handle the large volume of cases that legal service providers do, you, our students, provide high quality representation to clients who would likely go without help if we weren't here. And we're often able to work with other community organizations to be able to handle some of the larger um, cases and problems in our community using our unique expertise and resources. The other reason that clinics are so valuable is actually the reason that we're here right? You are students. We train the next generation of social justice warriors that are going to take on some of the most pressing issues of our time. Before I turn to recognizing our graduating 3Ls, I want to say a word about the important role of social justice lawyers in a time of crisis. The pandemic, as we all know, has unmasked and exacerbated some of the deep inequality that we fight in our work. It is also highlighted that we, lawyers who work in the public interest, are essential. We've been chairing at 7 p.m. for our frontline workers, and so it is fitting. It's 6.29, 30 minutes early, but it's fitting that I highlight some of the clinic and 1L students who have done some heroic work during the pandemic. This past Monday, our immigration clinic is lead counsel filed a class action on behalf of immigrants detained in three Florida detention centers, Chrome, Glades, and Broward. Co-counseling with some other organizations, they brought a constitutional challenge to the inhumane continued detention of men and women during this pandemic. So you see the, the students that are on your screen, a big shout out to them because they started working on this lawsuit last Wednesday they have 35 named plaintiffs in the class action and they virtually collected declarations from people detained at each facility um, and were able in that short period of time to, to be able to file a class action that is ongoing. So let's do a virtual finger snap. Let's say um, 
congratulations to all of them who leaned in on behalf of clients who needed them at a time when it would be understandable um, for those uh, for them to have stepped back um, and focused on their own needs. They're just an example because as the clinic students know, there are many, many others of you in all of our clinics who are continuing to do heroic work. And so as the names of our graduating 3Ls scroll across the screen, I wanna thank all of the students that have worked in not only our clinics, uh, the Center for Ethics and Public Service and some of our other public interest courses. I want to congratulate you and commend you for all of your time and your energy that you dedicated to public service while in law school. We've got the appellate clinic, federal appellate clinic, the health rights clinic. I wish all of you the best in your legal careers. I have no doubt that regardless of your specific practice area, you are going to continue to respond to the higher calling to be citizen lawyers and make a difference in your career. And so let's continue to um, congratulate them, do shout outs in the chat boxes, um, and do a round of applause to all of these students. We've got our lit skill students, many of whom are going on to the PD and, and pub, um, other public service office. We've got our prep students, shout out to our street law students, our community equity lab students, tenants rights, and so thank you again for all of the work that you did throughout law school. Um, as Josh said, you have already made an impact. And so whatever you do from here is, is simply more, more icing on the cake. So thank you, Dean Lennon. I turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Dean Stewart. And congratulations and thank you to not only our exceptional students, who walked the walk in their clinics, but to the supervising attorneys, our clinicians who lead, educate, and manage the cases in our educational environment, training our lawyers to be. Thank you so much to all of you. Miami Law has so many aspects, as you're hearing, of commitment to public interest and public service. Our programs are designed to create an opportunity for each and every student. An innovation that came a few years ago and is growing and growing is our social justice concentration a design curriculum which allows our students to focus their courses to acquire the skills that and the knowledge skills and abilities to transform systems um, to serve others and we are pleased to celebrate two students who are completing the concentration today Ariana Abulafia and Teresa Pinto and congratulate them on their ongoing and wonderful work I also want to thank all the affiliated faculty who are supporting our students in the social justice um, curriculum and concentration. In addition, thank you to Carrie Bettinger Lopez who serves currently as our chair. We have over 20 students currently enrolled in the ju social justice concentration and we look forward to supporting those students in their journey. It is now my honor to introduce a colleague, an outstanding lawyer, an advisor, a friend, and a wonderful, team member in the Hope Public Interest Resource Center. She directs our pro bono advocacy projects and serves as a resource for all students and advises our public interest leadership board, Sarah Baez. Thank you, Dean Lennon. Good evening, everyone. It is my privilege to be able to recognize the incredible group of students who make up the Public Interest Leadership Board, also known as PILB. PILB is made up of a dynamic group of Miami Law students dedicated to public service. PILB members are at the forefront of developing public interest and community service programs to increase opportunities for all Miami Law students. And they work hard to enhance the public service community on campus. Through their advocacy and fundraising efforts, their public interest network mentoring program, uh, and many other projects, PILB is able to serve as a center point of public interest activities for the law school. Thank you to all incoming and outgoing members of PILB. The names you just saw were only the members who completed the entire year of service on, the, on PILB, the 2019-2020 academic year. However, I wanna thank all of them. However, I want to particularly thank PILB's fearless leader this past year, uh, Maddie Seals, who served as PILB's president. 
Maddie, your passion and dedication made a substantial impact on the law school and you will truly be missed next year. At the same time, we are thrilled to announce that Erica Oyer will serve as PILD's next president and we thank her and all of PILD's new members for their commitment to enhancing the public interest community in the coming year. Thank you all. Next, I want to turn to the Innovative Service in the Public Interest Award. This award recognizes innovation in the creation of a new program or in the meaningful expansion of an existing program. This award recognizes the need for creativity, commitment, and vision in implementing programs, systems, and services to address the unmet legal needs of others. I am delighted to be able to announce that this year, the award will be granted to the student-led Wage Theft Advocacy Pro Bono Project. I'm gonna turn it over to Oscar Londonio, the Executive Director of We Count and the Supervising Attorney of the project, and then to Amelia Danes, a 3L who helped in the development of the project from day one, so that they can tell you more about this critical project and why it is so deserving of this award. Oscar, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sarah. And, and thank you, Sarah, for your ongoing support and investment in, in the project. It's been really, really, really helpful. Um, so, so my name is Oscar Londoño. I'm the executive director of WeCount. Uh, we are a membership-based and membership-led organization of low-wage workers and immigrant families. Uh, we're located in Homestead, although we're expanding to the rest of Miami-Dade. And our members are farm workers, uh, day laborers, domestic workers, and the low-wage immigrant workers that really make um, our communities and our economy thrive. Um, and over the past couple of years, one of the biggest challenges facing low-wage workers has been the problem of wage theft. Um, in 2010, Miami-Dade County passed a landmark county law called the Miami-Dade Wage Theft Ordinance. It was the first uh, law of its kind in the country that allowed workers to file free administrative claims on their own uh, through an administrative process. Unfortunately, 10 years later, uh, majority of low-wage workers don't know this ordinance exists, and the low-wage workers who are navigating this process are face facing a number of barriers. Language barriers, cultural barriers, opposition from employers who have reserved lawyers uh, while workers do not, um, and all of these barriers have created an environment where many low-wage workers, unfortunately, who are suffering wage theft, um, do not find justice in the courts or in the administrative process. And for us, we understand, particularly in this moment, that has really surfaced um, the importance of, of a paycheck and the importance of a job. You know, COVID-19 has really surfaced this idea that, you know, all of us in many ways are precarious, one crisis away from complete financial crisis. And for many low-wage workers in our communities, the ones that we serve, you know, they are confronting workplaces that are often unsafe, hazardous, dangerous. And one of the biggest obstacles is that for too many of them, uh, they're having to survive on poverty wages. And even when they choose to perform valuable work like farm work or domestic work or construction, um, they can't rely on receiving their check on time. And so we often think about wage theft simply as the legal violation of not getting a check that you're owed. But wage theft can look like many ways. And it, the impact of wage theft is not just on the worker, but it's an impact on the family as well. We can imagine what it's like uh, for the majority of low wage workers who are living check to check in this economy to not have your check on time. Uh, to not have the check that you're relying on to pay your mortgage or your rent or your bills or your medical costs. And so it creates domino effects that then simply facilitate a further entrapment in the dead cycle of poverty. And so we identified um, in the fall, uh, working with the students, a gap that exists in our community, which is that our ordinance actually allows for non-lawyer advocates to take on these claims. And so working with uh, the wonderful students uh, of the University of Miami, with Sarah, with Dean Lennon and others, um, we decided to create a collaborative project that is student-led, where students are really taking on ownership over the training, over the recruitment of the cases, where through my help, but really it is a student-led process, we do case rounds together to sort of brainstorm uh, what are the, the, the issues popping up in your cases, how do we collectively brainstorm those cases, um, and then where students are really taking cases on from the initial intake with the worker all the way through an administrative hearing. Uh, and so for the past couple of years, I've been one of the only nonprofit lawyers taking on these cases. And so it's been wonderful to see at the University of Miami create this new model of what it looks like for students to identify a concrete civil legal aid need in the community and then partner with an organization. Um, 
And so I just want to give the, the space to, to Amelia. I want to shout out all the students who have been uh, really like leaders of this, who have been sort of corralling me into, into case rounds, into trainings, um, and really sort of exhibiting what a different kind of legal education and legal practice could look like when our law students are actively working in our communities, in worker centers, in community-based organizations, in immigrant rights groups, to fill out a concrete need that's affecting so many workers in our community. So I'm, I'm very thankful, um, and I've been very inspired by, by the student leadership that this project has exhibited. Thank you, um, Oscar. Thank you, Sarah Baez and the, the Hope Center. Um, I'm Amelia Danes. I'm a third year student participant um, in the Wage Theft Advocacy Project, which we also call WTAP. Um, and the first thing that I want to do is thank all of the other students who are in WTAP as student advocates along with me. Um, as Oscar said, every student in WTAP is a leader of the project. Um, I'm the person speaking tonight, but by no means is, am I the most important part of this project. It's every single student who is in the project helps make critical decisions about um, every aspect from um, student recruitment, training, mentorship, case selection, and case strategy. So um, a, a, some snaps for all of them, absolutely. This is an award for every single participant. Um, I, I nominated our project for this award and I did it because participation has been so meaningful to me as a student. Um, as a 3L, I've had the opportunity at Miami Law to participate in externships, to participate in clinics, but WTAP has been a different experience that has allowed me to practice skills that, um, and to practice working with my colleagues in a way that I, I didn't get to practice in those other spaces. So I want especially to emphasize how important the collaborative aspect of this project is. Um, this grew out of a collaboration between the University of Miami School of Law National Lawyers Guild chapter, the South Florida National Lawyers Guild chapter, the HOPE office, and of course, Oscar. And it's important for students to begin practicing um, from day one, I think, the power that they can build and the impact that they can have by collaborating with other organizations, with practitioners and with one another. I also would like to emphasize that this is a project that has a number of first year law student participants. And I think this is incredible because when you come to law school, one of the first messages you hear as a 1L is to keep your head down, stay in your books um, and not worry about, um, about anything really besides the case law until you get to your first summer. And that's not what WTAP is about. The 1L students um, have been some of the core drivers of the project. Um, they take massive leadership roles. Um, they take responsibility for their cases, for uh, communicating with their clients and for making critical decisions. And, and I think when students have the opportunity to practice those skills from their first year of law school, they come out the other end at graduation, more creative, more dedicated, more passionate. So I'd like to commend particularly all of the 1L students who participated in WTAP and also the project itself for giving first year students an opportunity to participate in that way. Um, and finally, I'd, I'd just like to say that I'm so grateful to have been able to be part of a project like this in law school. It gives me an incredible amount of hope for the future of the legal profession and for Miami law. Um, and it, it's really, uh, it, reinvigorates my own passion for public interest work to sit in the room at case rounds and to see the contributions of my classmates. So um, thank you all for the award, and, but most importantly, I think thank you to the other student advocates um, for all of their work. Thank you so much um, for those beautiful words and presentation and your leadership. Oscar, we could not have convened in order to effectuate this outcome of a project that is so meaningful to the students and the individuals that they serve and without your leadership and willingness and Sarah, without your drive to make sure that it happened. Um, to each and every of the, um, one of the students, I want to echo Amelia's sentiment that for those of us who are wired to make a difference and for whom law school is a vehicle to have an increased opportunity to empower others and to break down the barriers to justice, 
having opportunities to touch that and to make that difference throughout law school is incredibly profound and it's the fuel through which the experience um, is really, really led. So thank you to both of you. Thank you to all of the students in the project and thank you, Sarah, for everything that you've done to put that into place. What an incredible array of students, opportunities. It's an incredible source of pride for, for us to be a part of this learning community that is dynamic, that is responsive, that is respectful to the needs of agencies near and far, to individuals facing barriers, and to our students as they grow and develop as lawyers. I want to thank our deans, our faculty, our staff, our supervising attorneys and clinicians, and our community leaders for supporting our students always and facilitating the work and the growth of our students. I want to give special thanks to our presenters who joined us this evening to do what we could to make this a spotlight moment for wonderful dedicated advocates um, throughout our community. And special thanks to Josh Spector as an alum coming back to share your walk and sharing your passion for pro bono. To the HOPE team, Sarah, Sharon, and Dietra for your support and all that you do to enliven our campus, to engage our students, and to ensure that the pro bono ethic is embraced by all. And I cannot forget to mention our rock star work studies, who from the moment we left campus, reached out with a willingness to do anything and everything to make sure that our work continued. Allison, Kayla, and Margot, you are phenomenal. So thank you so much. Um, for this, this evening, making it happen um, couldn't happen without the production support behind the scenes. And so to the dream team of Sabrina and Ryan, thank you for the work that you're doing here today and that you've been doing nonstop since we transitioned off of campus. Yes, round of applause. Thank you. It's the behind the scenes heroes who allow us to share messages and share these special moments. So thank you for everything that you've done. And then most of all, congratulations to our students. You're the core of what we do. You're the reason we do what we do. But for you, we are not doing what we love to do. The choices that you make as lawyers and community members will continue to move the needle towards justice. We know that. You inspire us with your tenacity and your heart, and we are so proud to play a small part in the journey of your legal education and your lives as lawyers and leaders. We celebrate each of you and Miami Law's commitment to public interest and pro bono. Thank you for joining us this evening and never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever does. Thank you, everyone. Be well, be safe, onward and upward. Good night.